And we've been, as I said, talking about and exploring what it means to be good at being rich. We've looked at this now from a couple of different angles. And we've seen that if you don't even know you're rich, it's kind of hard to be good at being rich. And we've looked at a, a few things that the Apostle Paul commanded rich people to do in order to be good at it, right? We've looked and learned about the, the danger of assuming that everything that we have been given is for our consumption. And we have seen last week about how generosity is the antidote for the negative side effects of wealth. And those are all incredibly great and very important principles and ones that I hope everybody is getting and, and, and connecting with and ones that hopefully you'll use that whether you think you're rich or not, that you'll still use and apply them to your life today. But if you really, really, really want to be good at being rich, there's still at least one more thing that you all need to know. In fact, you can practice everything else we've talked about, but without this next principle, principle here, uh, avoiding the side effects of wealth will be a constant struggle in your life. Now, this is an idea that comes out of the Old Testament um, that is also, of course, repeated later in the New Testament. And if you're, if you're one of those people who, who likes to work on just one thing at a time, right? Some people, you know, you're multitaskers and you, you got like 27 things going. Our teenagers are kind of like this a lot of times. They'll have the TV on, they have headphones that they're listening to, they're texting, and they're doing homework all at once. I can't do that. I'm serious. I, I, I am the least focused person, and you put me in an environment with noise, with talking, with distractions, I get nothing done. If I want to be successful, like when I write sermons, I go to where there's no people, there's no noise, there's no TV. I, I just, I can't have distractions. I can't focus if there's something else. I don't have that ability. I am the least gifted multitasker you will ever meet. I am a true single tasker. And if you're like me, if you are a single tasker, well, today is for you. This is the big one. This is a good one, right? This is your place to start. If you've been ignoring me for a few weeks, pay attention today, okay? And once you get this, all of the other aspects of being good at being rich will come much easier to you. The principle simply says this. It says, your success with regard to wealth is determined by your objective with regards to wealth. Does that make sense? Your success with regards to wealth is determined by your objective with regards to wealth. How successful you're going to be? depends on what you're going to do with it, right? It's true in almost every aspect of life. How you handle riches depends on your intentions for that wealth. There's a lot of things, of course, that we can do with money, right? And each and every choice that we have, that we make, has a set of predetermined outcomes in terms of what if... On our deathbed, we're looking back and we're saying, how did I use that set of money that God trusted me with? And if I'm looking back on my life, and I look at that pile of money that God gave me, I'll be able to say, was I good at being rich or not with that money that God gave me or with that time that God gave me or with these treasures and talents that God gave me? Because that's so much more than just money. Now, for some people, the basic objective for money is simply, I just want to provide for my family, right? And that's a, a, that's a great goal. That's a, a great goal to have. But if that is your only goal for your money, you probably won't be very good at being rich. Now, let me remind you. What did I tell you the very first week? You're rich. You are all rich. Woo! right? You woke up today in a heated house. You had running water. You didn't have to go break the ice off a pond to get something to drink. You drove here in a car, truck, van, bus, something. You didn't have to walk. Well, that's kind of cheating. Artist lives next door. 
<laughs> but we are rich, right? We, we have, I didn't, I didn't get up this morning and put on the very same clothes that I had to wear yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before that. I go to my closets and go, closets, plural, and go, I don't have anything to wear today. Nah. And I get down to my entryway in the closet. Which pair of shoes am I going to put on? Right? There's a lot of people in the world who never own shoes. I'm rich. I really am. And how you handle riches depends on your intention for that wealth. If your only goal, like I said, is to just barely provide for your family, you're probably not going to be good at being rich. A lot of wealthy people take great care of their families, but they still struggle to be generous, right? For other people, the goal can be, uh, I want to make as much money as possible. And some people are really good at that, right? But making money doesn't make you good at managing money. So there has to be something more. Another goal might simply be, I want to save as much as possible. And, and all the financial decisions you make in your life, whether comes whether or not it's going to grow or shrink your bank account, right? Now, savings is good. Being a saver is a good thing. Saving is important. Saving is biblical. So don't hear me say, don't save. Save. But it won't guarantee that you will look back on your life someday and see that you were good at being rich. Now, each of these goals has its merits. But I want to give you that one more objective that pulls all of these into balance. And it's the one that could be considered, you know, so to speak, true north. True north. Let's point north when I say it. True north on your compass when it comes to finances. Focus on this objective faithfully. And everything else will begin to fall into place. Achieve it, and you'll be good at being rich. And best of all, it provides a, a, a clear grid, a clear system for guiding every financial decision that we have to make. If you've got a Bible, would certainly invite you. You're welcome to open up. We're going to be in uh, First Chronicles. If you don't know where Chronicles is, that's... A little bit early beginning of the uh, Old Testament. First Chronicles 29 is where we're going to launch from here. And I'm going to tell you the story with that. See, 3,000 years ago, King David, you've heard of that guy, right? He's a guy who killed Goliath. We have King David in Israel. That's 3,000 years ago. We know his story fairly well if you've grown up in the church. And you know the story of David. There, there were some bumps along the way in his road to becoming king. Wars, scandals, betrayal. I mean, I've said this before, but David's life story would make an incredible set of movies. Incredible. Hollywood decided they wanted to make a good Bible story. David would be among the better stories for them to do. Eventually, though, David reaches a point in his life where he'd finally arrived, right? Right? The enemies were defeated. The battles have been won. Israel is now the superpower of their time. There was peace all throughout the land. And David was stinky, stinking, filthy, rich. Rich, rich beyond your wildest imagination. He had an incredible palace, right? The biggest, best house. An incredible kingdom. At an incredibly prosperous time in history. Truly, not all that different from our lives today. In many different respects. We live in the richest country. During what is probably the richest time in history. Have you seen what the stock market has been doing the last couple of years? It's at like 22,000 or something. 23,000? Oh my goodness. I haven't looked for a while. 
It just, now of course, we know that won't go forever, but prosperous times, folks. And the luxuries that we have today, right? Could you imagine if, if somehow we could like teleport through time King David from 3,000 years ago and put him right here on stage next to me? Light from the ceiling, right? Of course, he'd be interested in the snow. Where's your voice coming from? Running water and all these things that we take for granted, he would think are the most amazing things ever. Those luxuries we have today would blow David's mind. Now you see, David knew he was blessed. David knew his time was special. And his response to that knowledge should help us shape our own views on how to be rich in this day and age. See, David had always seen God's hand in everything. God was there for every giant that David faced. He was there for every battle that David fought. He was there for every victory won. And David writes about this all throughout the Psalms. We're studying those during our Wednesday Bible study. And David continually refers to these things in the Psalms, talking about God as his great provider. But as David looks out of his palace, he couldn't help but notice that his palace was opulent, beautiful, amazing, right? It was incredibly well built. Yet, over there, the tabernacle, where God's presence resides, it's kind of a ratty looking tent. David's up in his palace going, hmm, I got all this, and that's what God's getting. Hmm. So David resolves in his heart to build a permanent home for God, a temple. Right? David begins designing it, gets the architectural work done. He begins to raise money for it, for what would eventually become known as Solomon's temple, because David doesn't actually get to build the temple, but he gets to do the foundational work, getting ready for it. And this temple comes to be known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Amazing, amazing place. David moved gold and silver from Israel's treasury to help pay for the construction. And then David takes out of his own personal wealth an incredible sum. It's estimated in today's dollars, the amount that David gives to the building of the temple would be in the neighborhood of $14 billion. That's with a B, folks. That is a lot of money. He just gives it away. Very generous. But David was still rich after that. And when David calls the Israelites together and tells them about his plans to build this temple, the people immediately got behind it. Money begins pouring in. There was an overwhelming response to the understanding of how God was blessing Israel in that time, was blessing them incredibly. And so in that moment, then, generosity flowed out of the hearts of the Israelite people. And during the middle of all of this, David prays a prayer that gives us, a, gives us a ton of insight into what his heart was, his, his perspective regarding life and God and the purpose and how we should go about managing money. And it's in this prayer where we discover the one primary objective that should guide the way that we think about and handle our money. This is the key to being good at being rich. And we find it, as I said, First Chronicles 29. 10 and 11 is where I'll jump off from. And there it says, Praise be to you, Lord God, of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. You see, David looks back over everything that God had taken him and the Israelites through, and he concludes, God, this is all you. This is all about you, Lord. I mean, David is the greatest king, probably in the history of the world, definitely the greatest king of the greatest nation of his time. 
And here we find David bowing down before the God whom he considers to be the actual true king. And he continues on in verse 11. He says, For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You, Lord, are exalted as head over it all. You see, as far as David was concerned, everything belonged to God. All the gold, all the silver. David and his people were just moving God's money from one place to another in order to to build a, a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant as they were building the temple. Next he says in verse 12, he says, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are the strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. David is saying that not only did God own all of the material things, but he's also the source of all the things that money can't buy. Honor, power, strength. David's comment was meant to describe everything a person enjoys in life. Everything from what we have to what we accomplish. And no matter who held what, David is saying it ultimately belongs to God. Now for those who had you know, kind of followed David's story, those who had observed his rise to the top, this statement might have come to them as a, a little bit of a, a shock, a little bit of a, a surprise, so to speak. I mean, they had watched David come up from nothing as a little sheep herder, as the youngest of brothers who... His brothers almost forgot he existed. He was, he's out in, the, out in the woods when they're coming around to find the next king. They've got to send for the kid, right? David, you want me to go get... Oh, I'll go get David. He can't be king. Oh, David? No, there's no way he can fight Goliath. He's a runt. Not David, Right? So the people who had watched David come up, they, they knew his story. They knew what he had overcome. They'd seen his cunning in battle. They, they'd seen his wisdom as a leader. They saw the sacrifices David had made for the good of others. But now, David wasn't taking any credit for any of the things that he had achieved, right? It was David's claim that everything belongs to God. Everything comes from God. And everything is dispensed by God. And he concludes with this in verses 13 and 14. He says, Now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have been given only what comes from your hand. How often is that the perspective of rich people today? David considers himself unworthy of the opportunity to be so generous. That's the opposite of so many, the opposite mindset of so many in our culture today. Most believe, this is all mine, right? You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, right? It's all mine. I deserve all of this. I worked hard for this. I'm entitled to this. That's a horrible word. I hate the word entitled. It's mine. In America, we generally believe that success is the byproduct of hard work, don't we? And while that is indeed often true, it's God who gives us both the ability as well as the opportunity to work hard. It all comes from Him. So if it all belongs to God, right? And it all comes from God and it's all distributed by God. What is the one thing that should govern our approach to money? 
How do you summarize David's mindset about money? If you wanted to have the very same perspective for yourself, what should the main objective be? And as I think about David's prayer here, two simple words come to mind. Honor God. Honor God. Those two words encapsulate all the things that David declared about his riches. If you were to pursue only one goal for everything that you possess, this should be it. Honor God. Serve that single objective and everything else will fall into place. There was a time in my life where I used to think that, you know, 10% tithe was like almost a magical number. You know, 10%. You, you remember Ron Popeil before the pocket fisherman? You remember the pocket fisherman, right? Before that, though, he had Ron Popeil's little oven, right? You remember that oven? What was the catchphrase that went with that oven? Anybody remember? Set it and forget it, Right? Ron Popeil would get out a chicken, put it on the rotisserie, open up that glass door, slide that chicken in, turn the dial, set it and forget it. Come back in an hour. Chicken will be ready. It was going to revolutionize the way we cook food. Does anybody own one? I don't think it worked. It was a good idea. But he was selling it on the idea that you could set it and forget it. This will make your life easier. And then, of course, when it was done, they'd cut it and eat it. Oh, greatest thing I've ever eaten. Oh, delicious. Nom, 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 nom. You set it and you forget it. I used to think kind of money was that way. You set it and you forget it. Give 10%, you can set it and forget it financially, right? Autopilot. Tithe and you were all set. You're all done handling money. Everything's good. You've made your peace with God. You've been faithful. It doesn't, the rest of it, you do whatever you want. Right? Doesn't matter. You punched the clock financially. And as long as I give God his cut, now I'm free to do whatever I want. God, here's yours. I'm taking the rest. Right? I'm taking the rest for me. Ten is you, the rest for me. But that doesn't sound at all like what David is talking about, does it? And you see, the more money that we get, actually, the harder it can be to be generous. On average, those with the most wealth give by percentage the least. That's a truth in America. A sad, sad truth. Those with the most by percentage give the least. Year after year, data bears that out. When I was a kid and I got a dollar... If I had to give away 10 cents, that wasn't a big deal, right? If I get $100 for my birthday, well, if I got to give $10 of that away, so be it. Not a big deal. But when those numbers start to grow and you start adding some zeros to the end, it gets harder and harder and harder to give those bigger numbers away, doesn't it? It gets tough when those numbers grow. And when that scales up in our adult life, we can have all this wealth to the point where it almost feels irresponsible to be giving it all away. Right? That sounds kind of reckless to give that much money away. Have you ever been so generous? Have you ever given money away and then for that split second kind of had that fear like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? A little moment of panic, your heart beats a little faster, you get a little shot of adrenaline like, that might have been dumb. I think I gave too much. Was that a 10 or a 100 I just put in the offering plate? Oh no. Right? It gets tougher when those amounts grow. I'm giving how much away? There's a simple explanation for our hesitation. We've started to view our money as our money. 
is no longer God's. In those moments, we've lost touch with the fact that everything belongs to Him. Everything comes from Him. And it's all dispensed by Him. And in a way, we get to buy into the myth that we own it. And somehow we're giving it to God. Right? Can we give to God what is already His? No. We cannot. We have it wrong in our minds. And as David's prayer suggests, it's not about giving, folks. It's about living. And the very same theme is found throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, wherever you look. We are to honor God with everything. Not just with a set dollar amount, not just with a set percentage amount, but with everything that we possess. It's not 10%, folks, it's 100% that we need to honor God with. Kim and I have some friends from Wasika, and they're about our age, and they have a daughter, Justice's age, so she's eight. And uh, they just took this family trip to France um, a couple of weeks ago. Really cool opportunity to take their eight-year-old daughter to France. And so they went to the Eiffel Tower, and they went to all these places. And one day I saw pictures of the Louvre, or however you say that, I don't speak French. You know what the Louvre is? <laughs> the Louvre, it's like Brett Favre. I don't know how to say it. Favre, ra, 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 ra. The Louvre, I think is how you say it, right? How do you say it? Louvre? All right. See, I, I'm married to an art teacher, but I'm an idiot in art. Anyhow, this art museum in France right? World famous. The probably best collection in the entirety of the whole wide world. Some of the most valuable pieces of art. If you saw the Da Vinci Code, that was kind of the setting for the Da Vinci Code. If you remember that movie from Dan Brown, they've got Raphael, they've got Rembrandt, they've got Michelangelo in their collection. And, and despite the fact that many, many, many of their pieces are, are literally priceless, this museum loans out artwork to other museums from time to time. So here's a question. When they loan out their art, what percentage of that art do they expect to receive in return when the other museum is done? What percent do they expect the other museum to take good care of? If they get back 10%, are they like, oh yeah, I got 10% back, yay. Good job. Oh, we didn't need that Mona Lisa anyhow. We got a couple more. Right? Oh, that hole. Psh, nobody's going to notice. Well, we got scotch tape in back. We'll fix it. Right? Oh, your roof leaked and it got all over this painting. That's okay. We got some brownie. And psh, wipe it off. We got the big pack from Costco. It'll clean up. I mean, wars have been started over less than this. If you returned only 10% of that art, ho, 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 ho. The governing principle behind this art exchange is ownership. This art museum in France, they own all of it. And therefore they expect, and everybody else understands, that they have a responsibility if they are going to borrow it, if they're going to be using it, that they need to take good care of it, right? Because that's what you do when you're handling other people's stuff. You should take as good or better care of it than if it was your own. Is that how you handle your stuff? Not just your money? But things like honor, strength, opportunity, time, talents. Again, it's from the Bible. Everything that's yours belongs to God, comes from God, and is dispensed by God. And here's the clincher. God sees, and God sees it that way as well. It's all His on loan to us. With that being the case then, 
what would it look like for you to honor God with everything that He has given you? Does that make some butterflies in some of your stomachs? Make you a little uncomfortable? I mean, yeah, I like giving God my money, but I don't want to open my house to people. I just got a new car. That homeless guy, he smells bad. He can't have a ride. Oh, that might be inconvenient. I don't have time for that. Right? You see, God doesn't just want to take your money. He just wants to make sure your money doesn't take you. He wants to make sure your possessions don't possess you. That's what God wants. And he doesn't need your permission anyhow to take all of your stuff, right? How many people did he ask last time a tornado came through somewhere? Right? A hurricane went through Houston. It's all his already, folks. And not only that, but God is a giver, not a taker. He didn't send Jesus to earth to collect a debt owed, did he? No. If he did, we would be in big trouble. I can't pay that debt. He sent Jesus to give his life for you. And by calling you to acknowledge him as the owner of all of your stuff, he wants to give you something else. He wants to give you freedom and he wants to give you peace. The freedom and peace that come from letting go. Maybe your children have been out of the home for a while. Or maybe you've got a friend you haven't seen for a long time. Maybe it's your soldier coming home. You greet him at the airport. How do you greet him? My stuff, mine. How would it feel if we greeted people like this? No. Arms wide open. Come here. We need to open our arms. We need to find the freedom and peace that comes from not holding tightly to the stuff of this earth that moths and rust might destroy, but instead taking those things that God has given and trusted us with and using them, honoring God to his glory. The more you hold on to your stuff, the less peace you will have. The more you hold on to your stuff, the less freedom you will have. God knows this. And you know what I'm talking about. So let me ask you once again, what would it look like for you to honor God with everything? All of your stuff. Time, treasure, talents. For some of us, it will require that. We'll have to be more generous, right? I don't know where this will land for you. But if you ask God, He will show you how to honor Him with everything He's given you. Not just with a percentage, not with a little corner or segment of your life, with everything. When we loosen our grip on our wealth, our wealth loses its grip on us. And God is honored by that. Hold on to your stuff less tightly this week and use all of it to honor God. Amen? Let's pray.